Okay, welcome back to ThinkTech. This is Global Connections on ThinkTech, and I am your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called India-40, The Circle of Demons, From Manuscript to Amazon. <laughs> and we're going to talk to Peter Adler, who has published a book now. And the book relates to his experience in the Peace Corps in India in the 1960s. There it is. There's the book. There's Peter Adler. Yeah. Son of a gun. <laughs> and the rare journey. This is it. So people make deep into the soul of an entirely different civilization. And as a result, they find their own. Wow. Okay. And Peter is speaking at the East West Center on July 25th. Um, so if you, if you have a chance to go there and see that, that'd be worthwhile. The third floor, I think it is. Uh, in the Brown evening. bag. Bring your own lunch. Brown bag. Okay. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure to be back here. <laughs> All right. So good it to see you. Indeed. So I was, you know, kind of getting my mind in gear for the show, and I went back and looked at the show you and I did on December 23rd, 2016. And if you will, my opening was such, it was amazing. It was an amazing show, and I want to play the opening again. I'm going to do that now, sort of get into the mood for this discussion. Ready? Watch. Rock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Welcome to Creative Contributions here on a given Friday. Today we'll talk about a manuscript that defines a man I know and a notable period in American history which we should all know about. He and it, they are about the Peace Corps. That means Peace Corps, the way you pronounce it in India in the 1960s. Uh, right about the time when the Vietnam War was happening with all its destructive implications. While the war was destructive, the Peace Corps was just the opposite. When I graduated from NYU Law School in 1965, first I went into the graduate program there in that school, which was not protected from the draft. When they came for me, I answered with my own move, go into the service that saves lives, the Coast Guard. I could have done, I could have gone into the Peace Corps just as easily, I think. And some of my friends, I recall one, his name was Matt Seymour. I don't know if Peter knows him. He was my co-graduate counselor at the dormitory at NYU. I was dazzled with his move. Um, but I, I love the idea that he went. And today, all I have is the memory of him in his 20s, along with me and his name, Matt Seymour. Now, Peter Adler answered the call by going into the Peace Corps. And it certainly changed him. More than that, he decided to write it up, and we're here today to talk about his wonderful, heart-rending lessons and experiences uh, in living the life of the most exciting global adventure that came out of John Kennedy and the optimism of the early 1960s and global optimism that we can look at today, that our generation at the time could ever have. That was the time. Peter was, at the core of it, incredibly lucky to be there in the mainstream of those experiences and we are incredibly lucky to be able to talk with him and soon enough to have the benefit of his recollections and stories and his manuscript and book about the experiences that defined his life and certainly have enlightened and do enlighten ours. Welcome to the show, Peter. Adler. Thank you, Jay. Well, that was the beginning of our last show on December 23rd with Peter Adler. And we talked about his book, India 40. Uh, the Circle of Demons and more, and uh, we, we, uh, we went through a number of the, the chapters and the, and the uh, really important things that he was talking about. So it was 1966, the war in Vietnam had intensified, 50 freshly minted college graduates were invited to train for a possible Peace Corps assignment to India. Of the 50 who began training in a Texas border town called Zapata, only a handful and Peter calls them the Dirty Dozen. I guess they call themselves That's the Dirty Dozen at the time. Was, though. They finished a two-year tour in India. So India 40 and the Circle of Demons by Exebris Publishing. Uh, Ex Libris. Exebris Publishing. Uh, just recently. It's part memoir. It's part uh, creative nonfiction. It recounts a life-changing journey of Peter and the others in which death, disease, drugs, and political crazies and corruption in India took a toll. So the true heart of the story, says Peter, I'm quoting. <laughs> and by the way, I have, some, I have some reviews of this book, which I will quote from, is the rare journey people sometimes find make deep, they, and that deep into the soul of an entirely different civilization. And as a result, they find their own. And this is really the, the core of our discussion today. So let's get current. 
We met on December 23rd. We had, a, and if you guys have a chance at all, please look at the old video. It is one of the best Think Tech ever did, in my opinion, and that's saying something. Um, it was December 23rd. It was Peter Adler. It was India Dash 40 Circle of Demons. You can find it on YouTube, or you can find it on our site, thinktechhawaii.com. Um, so, um, to catch up with you, Peter, since de December 23rd, you've managed to take this, this you know, huge, maybe uncontrolled manuscripts and make it into a book that is now available on Amazon. Did you hear that? Amazon, it's on Amazon right now. Okay. What was the process like? So, um, Hemingway once, somebody once asked Ernest Hemingway, not that I'm Ernest Hemingway, but somebody said, how do you write a book? And he said, you sit over a typewriter and open a vein. And that's <laughs> kind of what this has all been all about. This has been an odyssey to try and tell a story and get the arc of the story right. And uh, memory's always a little fickle, but I talked to my buds, the guys we uh, oh, still in great. India so with. Oh, helped you in the detail. Yeah, and we've oh, met, yeah. and some of our friends have passed away, and we've gathered together to remember them, but also to talk and remember that. And I know memory's fickle. Trial lawyers make wonderful hay out of all that. So, <laughs> so um, finished the book, uh, finished the manuscript, went through a lot of editing. What's it like editing when he says to you, Peter, this is not going to work. You have to change this. I, I love it. I actually love it. I actually <laughs> welcome that. And I take that kind of editing very well. And um, so it's been finishing that up and then bringing it to this publisher and getting this thing sort of honed down. And Shorter. Sorry? Shorter. Some of it's shorter, yeah, and some yeah. of it just getting it corrected, getting it typographically corrected, yeah, getting it, uh, you know, language pieces uh, fixed up, and um, so it's been, it's been an odyssey, and I'm so glad I did it, and I'm glad I'm done. Sure, but oh, yeah. as, as we <laughs> talked about before the show, I mean, to me, it's worth mentioning, we, sh we need to mention this, that you spoke about your youth. You were in your early 20s in 1966 and thereafter. Two years at that age, you're very impressionable. You're in a completely different civilization, different in every way, and you're, you know, you're subject to it. You're vulnerable. You're fragile. You you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, you could get sick, fall off a, fall off a cliff. Who knows what? Be murdered. Um, you could run into some political problem that uh, that is profound uh, in a foreign country where you don't really necessarily have the support you might expect as an American citizen in those days. And India today is a lot different than it was 50 years Very ago. Very different, yeah. although in some ways it continues to be India, yeah. which is different, but it's the same as it was. I went back, I've been back a couple of times to kind of go back even to the place where I lived, this, which was then a village of 5,000, 6,000 people. Today it's 30,000, it's a commercial center. I found people that uh, I knew, oh, wow. or still remember the, the kids of people that I knew. Wow. And I went back there very specifically to say thank you to a few people who have passed away. But I talked to their families and wanted to say thank you for keeping a peripheral and supervisory eye on two young Americans who were idiots and didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> the Peace Corps doesn't exist in that town anymore. Right? Not anymore. Peace Corps is out, out of India. It got uh, removed. You know, a number of countries said we don't want them. We don't need you. We don't want you. Yeah, too bad. And in fact, that was part of the genesis of all this was uh, discussions between uh, Lyndon Johnson and Indira Gandhi in 1966. And we were a political add-on to a wheat deal. And they wanted, Lyndon Johnson wanted Peace Corps volunteers and AID workers, I think both for cosmetic reasons, because he wanted to do something better than just uh, showing that we were fighting in Vietnam. It's soft power. It was. That's what it is. I think that's exactly right. And, and uh, you know, you want to have good diplomatic relations at the grassroots level so people in India like Americans and all that is the price you have to pay. But, you know, in terms of your experience and our experience as a generation, this got us out of the country. It got us to right. learn and, and uh, engage with countries everywhere, even developing countries. We became much wiser. Uh, they became more knowledgeable about us. It was, this, was, this was the time to which we want to return to make America great again, I think. America was great in those days. America was in turbulence then. In, it's true, it was a Vietnam, very turbulent that, time. That wasn't so great. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was what it was. And today, we, you know, there's people now who think uh, the war in Vietnam, which they called the American War, by the way, that the people think that was, you know, like the French and Indian War or something like that, or the <laughs> Franco-Turkish -Turk War. You know, and so people, the new generation really doesn't know much about it. And that's one of the stories we need to tell. We need to remind people 
that uh, hey, we've been through these things before, and uh, it's, they're tough times, and it's always been tough times, and always will be. Yeah, and we talked uh, also. It was, it was uh, very powerful for me. We talked about national service. Yes. Talked about you know you're doing yours. I did mine in the Coast Guard. Really not the same, and I envy you for what you did. Uh, the Coast Guard was relatively protected. You were unprotected. Uh, it was much more adventure, much more learning experience for you, I think. Um, but you know, the, the whole idea of national service has, has gone out of style. People grow up now, they have no contact with the federal government. The federal government is some uh, obscure, adverse party. <laughs> they don't like it, they don't trust it, they don't be part of it. They pay their taxes grudgingly, uh, they do not do their civic duty. Um, we're disconnected that way, but in those days, we were connected. You know, I have a good friend. Uh, his name is Victor Kraft, and Victor lives here. And while I was in India, um, you know, killing rats and growing chickens up for businesses and building a few schools, he was in Vietnam, and he was an aircraft mechanic, and he was fixing up airplanes that had been shot out of the sky or shot down, and it was full of bullet holes. And I've seen pictures of it. And we have a lot of different political views that diverge, but we we have that common thing about the value, the powerful value looking back of national service and kind of wishing that people would find that way to do that one way or another. Yeah, it's really too bad we gave that up. Not because people didn't like the draft, and nobody likes the draft. Nobody likes getting killed right. um, or exposing yourself in harm's way, but, but the, the value of it was that you connected with the country and the country connected with you and you connected with other countries and, um, you know, this was very right. important in our time we had that. We don't have it anymore. So we have a little bit. We have AmeriCorps. We still have Peace Corps, and we have people doing, you know, national service of one kind. Of, but it is small, yeah. and it's not a part of the the norm. Yeah. So it's when you talk norm. about, when you write about this period of history, you're writing about something that's largely iconic and forgotten. Um, I think so. No longer, no longer in the mainstream. And so what I was saying before the show began was, um, I envy you the opportunity. Of, of taking a good part of your life to write this up. It's, it's, uh, you wrote it up out of memory. You, you checked with your cohorts in the, in the Dirty Dozen, um, which, which kept you in touch with them. That's right. And, and then you come out with a book that is a statement, not only of the 1960s and your experience in India, but all of your life. Because your life was unfolding as you were writing it. You were building all that wisdom into the lens, into the perception of what happened back in, in uh, but who knew back then I mean back knew, then you're right. just a kid and you're experiencing all this stuff and trying to collate it and put it together and bring together the right story and uh, you know some of what's in that book is mm, you know creatively enhanced shall we say but at the end there's a coda and I own up to what I've changed I try to own up oh, to very it. good yeah yeah so if, if you look at the end there's some people in there who are fictitious there for a good story, but the core of the story is this mm, odyssey through inner and outer geographies. I mean, that's what's really going on. Odyssey, indeed. A, a, a mission of discovery, an experience of discovery, and an experience of discovery externally and internally. Mission impossible. Mission impossible, <laughs> but you made a pretty good record. It was good it. fun. Yeah. And, and you mentioned before the show also this great quote from the Lincoln movie. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I was watching the film again of Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis, who's a fine actor. And it, you know, this is Lincoln towards the end of the Civil War, and, there's tr and it's trying to pass the 13th Amendment. And uh, he's talking with his wife, uh, who's grieving, and maybe really off, quite off, and grieving the loss of her first son, and worried about the, another one that may die in the war. And she's berating him, and he says, you know, time has a way of thickening things. And so it is, when you look back, when you look back, you see the outlines of a bigger story or interest, more interesting yeah. story that you couldn't see while you're in it. Yeah. You and see the arc of things. And that's this book. I that's think so. This book I is hope thickened so. by time. Yeah. It's made richer by your own life experience in all yeah. these years you've been writing it. So in, in a word, before we have our break, what arc is there? Part of it is the journey into an entirely different civilization. It's like going to Klingon or something like that. I mean, it's just like going into... Star Trek into another world. I mean, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, even though I've lived here most of my life. And it was a, you know, just a small high school sheltered community. Uh -huh. Didn't know much about what was beyond the south side of Chicago. Yeah. 
I actually thought I was going to go in the Coast Guard too, but Is that's that right? another story. We would have loved to have oh. you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> the story is really going outside into another civilization that you don't know and don't understand and having to grapple with that. Uh, Peace Corps gave us a very good language training, but it was just a starter, you know, and then once we're in the country, we learn lots more. And it was really about understanding people at a person-to-person -person level and trying to do some, get a few things done in a place that's very different pace and a very different rhythm. But I have to say I had time, my, my roommate and I had a lot of time to read, especially during long monsoons when it was just raining. There was no, nothing going on. And um, we read a lot. We talked to a lot. We experienced a lot. Uh, and that includes people uh, departing the Peace Corps because of drugs, overdoses, suicides, uh, right wing, uh, you know, xenophobes, all kinds of, we were accused of being CIA agents. So we had a lot of people sort of pecking at us about that. And were you CIA agents? And we had to explain if we really were, why would we be in this village? There's nothing to see. So, you know, it, a lot of stories that I tried to weave into this thing. But it is about the outer journey into India, but it's also about changes in myself. A journey to awareness on all levels. Yeah. Uh, so that enhances your life in general. Yeah. yeah. I want thus, to... thus enhanced, we're going to take a short break. <laughs> That's Peter Adler, <laughs> author and more. We'll be right back. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I still have nightmares. I feel overwhelmed. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, we're back. We're live with Peter Adler, who is a mediator, facilitator, and a principal in Accord 3.0, which is a professional what, consulting organization. Yeah, it's small. Mm -hmm. And um, he's really had a rich life. And um, now to look back and see what happened in India in those days, uh, you know, it broadens, enhances life. It's an admirable and uh, enviable uh, kind of experience. And he has this book, and in a while I'm going to ask you to read from the book, sure. as I always do. And, um, and then we have some photos we want to show you from Peter's time in India. But first, what is this thing in the table here? So this is called a Nataraj. And anybody from India would know this instantly, and many people not from India would know this. And this is, Shiva is one of three major deities, uh, primal forces. And Brahma is the creator of the universe, and Vishnu is a stabilizer of things, and Shiva is a destroyer of things. And they all play multiple roles, and they all have good sides and bad sides, and many incarnations. And it's, I, I've spent lots of time trying to understand all this stuff, and I only claim to know this is little that, bit. Is that Hindu? Is it yeah. Hindu? Yeah. yeah. So this is in the Hindu cosmology, and it has lots of symbolic meanings around it. Uh, the piece that is kind of so interesting to me, and I don't know if you can actually see it. You can. But, but his foot, you see right there? Yeah. Let's see. So that is a dwarf. And you notice his foot is stepping on that, and that dwarf's name is Apsmara, which is ignorance. And so Shiva is trying to bring some truth and enlightenment into the world and stepping on and trying to keep Apsmara at bay. So interesting, but this is full. This is the circle of fire that he will bring to destruction of the universe. Everything we know will be destroyed, then a new universe will be born. 
Is that the circle of demons? Yeah, part of it. Some okay. of the demons are inside of all of us. Okay. Our own, you know, homesickness. We and, all have our own Shiva. Exactly. <laughs> so so the, that's the, the, the demons are, uh, he's all constantly fighting battles uh, with demons. And sometimes he invents demons. They can make demons, like we can make their weapons to be used. And then sometimes they come after him. You would not have learned this on the south side of Chicago. No, it wasn't part of my <laughs> as, as you mentioned before the show, and, and people who uh, you know, live their lives uh, within the continental U.S. boundaries uh, and, and spend their time on text messaging, they would not have learned this either. <laughs> south side of Chicago, 1960s, who knew? Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Even now. <laughs> Even now. <laughs> You know, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the dwarf of, uh, of ignorance down there, that's us. That is us. <laughs> that was me. That was me. Well, yeah. let's look at some uh, pictures and uh, go through some of your slides. So these are pictures from the book, I guess. Yeah. And we'll see, and you can explain and give us some detail. All right, this is the cover sheet for the book, yeah? That's right. And basically, what I, one of the things I believe is in it, uh, partly embodied in this book is you know, I, I've been trained in social sciences, but I started out in biological sciences. So mm -hmm. I have, and I still have a great interest in science. And we, in science, you believe the world is made up of animals and plants and minerals and strands and particles and atoms and chromosomes. I think the world's made of stories. <laughs> stories make the world. We make the stories. We make the world. And that's, that's part of what this book is all about. Every story you could put together, you put in this book, too. <laughs> I tried. It's full of good material. Okay, let's go to the next one. So this is the Dirty Dozen, or part of it. It's not everybody's in there. And uh, this is 1967. We're uh, skinnier. We're not quite as uh, you know, healthy as we might be today. Uh, and this was just a picture taken by... Uh, our group, and there, you know, our group had whittled down to this group. And the movie The Dirty Dozen was out, and somebody said, we're the Dirty Dozen uh, of India. See. So that's how that name but came about. It could have been a bunch of recruits for the Army, too, at the <laughs> same <laughs> time. It could have been. It's it misbegotten was that period bunch. of time. Yeah. yeah. So there we were. I mean, we were wearing the 1966 shirts, Madras shirts, and Madras. a couple of our Indian friends there. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's just a picture. But, the, again, this is... Uh, you know, this inner search, and there's also the outer business of yeah, adjusting yeah. in a new culture, and there's the inner story, too. Yeah. It's happening to everybody. So Captain glad you have these photos. Yeah. Well, some of my buds brought those. And why now? Why would this, and what part of the reason for this is uh, the guy in the middle with the kind of vertical striped shirt just passed away. His name was Peter Van Zyl. Uh, we had a gathering together in uh, Medford, Oregon to remember him. And part of this is, you know, our ranks are diminishing. We're, you know, yeah, sure. we're not as young as we once were, getting a little longer in the tooth. Yeah, I, I don't want to do the math, but the math is, <laughs> will tell you that. <laughs> That's right. So and I think also part of the reason for now is because it is the 50th year anniversary of the war in Vietnam. That was the era. And Ken Burns has a big series coming yeah, out yeah, on that. Right. Got to set, got yeah, to so, so I mean, I just think it's an important uh, memory. And third, and this goes back to our previous discussion, Jay, you know, uh, Kierkegaard, I remember reading something, he said, life has to be lived forward, but you can only understand it backwards. It's and the same thing as Lincoln. It's exactly right, and it's <laughs> thickened. It's Now it's thickened. That story is thickened. Yeah, and kids, when you go out for lunch today, or when you go home, and your mother asks you, you know, what did you study today, tell them you heard about Kierkegaard, <laughs> uh, because I think that in, Danish philosopher every day. <laughs> I think all of us were also wanting to get out of Dodge. I mean, we, you know, we all had our individual Dodges, and you had yours, and we just needed to break out. And part of that is being a 21 or 22-year-old. Part of it was the times, uh, just needing to find a new path and go your own way. Yeah. And you grow up, you have to grow up. Have to do that. That's why it's important for kids to get out wherever they go. Yeah. Go to another country, go to another experience, learn subject yourself, expose yourself. And learn the language and live with some people. I mean, it's one thing to go as a tourist and just take, you know, jump on a bus and see the sights. It's quite another working and living and trying to understand the language and learn, we know that language and culture yeah. wrap yeah, together. Yeah. All, of the, all of those good things, all of those, it's summer camp plus. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. On steroids, if you That's will. exactly <laughs> right. More pictures. So, um, this this is uh, this just these are just scenes from India, but that lady in the middle there 
is Japanese. Her name is Carolyn Watanabe. She's from Hawaii, and she's my wife. And part of the story in here is a love story. Is, I mean, look at that. She's stunning. And so uh, yes. part of it, we had a, a very odd courtship, only four dates, and we decided to get married. Oh, and we got committed. She stayed on to finish her tour. She was a public health worker. And I finished mine six months early, came home. She came back later. We got married here in Hawaii in 1969. And, uh, but, but so part of this is the memory of all this, too. That's part sure, of it. It's all That's part of the thickening, isn't she it? she in the book? Yes, she is. OK. And we have, very we have very different stories about how we met. But mine is true. <laughs> okay. Mine is true. <laughs> that's great. So uh, I guess another thing that's important to remember, again, we've said a little bit about it, but the 60s was tumultuous. It was a turbulent time. And we're living through some turbulent times ourselves, politically, culturally, socially, technologically, every which way. But the war was going on, uh, huge protests. People were getting killed at Kent State. Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, students' protest was erupting. There was lots of marijuana smoking around, and lots of uh, fragrance in the air, a, lot of, a whole change in counterculture, black culture. So the backboard of this story is important. It's an important piece of this, because we're not independent actors devoid of any history and that uh, context I think is qu quite important. Those, those times were transformational yeah. for the country and for our generation. Yeah. Yeah. Who would have thunk? Yeah. What else? So th this is every, you know, every cultural group has an origin story, you know, uh, and if you're a Muslim or you're a Jew or you're a Christian or you're a Hindu, there's some story that goes way back, and here's how we came into being. And the story of our group, the political genesis of this, was in 1966, Indira Gandhi and Lyndon Johnson had a meeting. And Lyndon Johnson uh, was promulgating something called public law for, uh, I forgot the number, one of the public laws. That was a big wheat deal, and it had a lot of strings attached to it. So they were giving wheat to combat starvation and help promote agriculture in India, Pakistan, South America. And what they did was they, they really wanted to uh, promote and have Peace Corps volunteers and AID workers in conjunction with it. India didn't want them. They really, they said, we got a million engineers and doctors that are out of work. Why do we need freshly minted college people? <laughs> so Lyndon Johnson said, that's the terms of the deal. And he was over there. Got to do know. it. Yeah. Yeah. And so we know that he was a great deal maker and that was his deal. Not bad. Not bad at all. No. I mean, so that's, that's the origins of this. And it took us a while to understand that. And I've talked to a, a former diplomat uh, from India who said, you got most of it right. There was a bigger lens going on internationally, had to do with international finance and so on. But that was the origin of this. Because we, we, we were the 40th group in just a few years to be inserted into India. Pioneers. Pioneers, but think about that, 40 groups. That's a lot to be packed in in just a few countries. Yeah. In a few in a few years, would you, from your vantage now, after writing this book and all, would you want to see a, a resurgence of that kind of uh, popularity, a kind of number, that kind of force in in the, the Peace Corps? Well, truth is, there was a lot of bad programming. There was such a rush to put people on the ground uh, that I don't think the Peace Corps did a very good job. And that's another part of this chronicle that there were a lot of mistakes were made. We went in, and the the program we thought we were ostensibly going to work in was not virtually non-existent. It was very corrupt. It was very, uh, we, it was called a rural manpower program. And the idea was to take off-season agricultural labor, put them together on infrastructure projects in the rural area, schools, roads, market roads, wells, bridges. And uh, so we were trained, I was actually trained in construction. I mean, I was a history and English major, but we got good <laughs> training. And the language was the key. Yeah. And, but the program was sort of a facade. Could it have been improved over the years? Yes. Was, was it at all improved? I'm not even sure there? that program exists anymore. Mm -hmm. I think this came out of some of those big kinds of World Bank and Asia Development Bank yeah. five-year plans, which yeah. were popular at the time. Yeah. <coughs> and and uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, I asked, when I went back to India a couple years ago, I asked for the people who were part of that program, and nobody knew. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's sort of faded into history. The whole that thing. program, for sure. And this makes it live, this book. It's a remembrance of it, for indeed, sure. Indeed, well, you know, I mean, for me who wasn't there, for all the people who weren't even alive at that time, we have to understand this. It was a, it was an essential element of transformational time in American <coughs> history and, uh, and society. 
Um, it's just as important as the Vietnam War, is the whole generation, and you were part of that generation. You know, what's interesting, Jay, is we, we got there and we were expecting to be deployed and put to work. And we got there and we were sort of paraded around for some political purposes. But, you know, I'm ready to build schools and roads and that kind of stuff and work on those projects. Uh, no, nothing's going on. So we'd go and complain to our Peace Corps supervisors in uh, Mumbai, Bombay, which was, um, you know, a nine-hour bus trip. And they'd say, just go back to the village and do something useful. You know, sorry, it's not working out. So we had to make our own work, and which we did. Good. And you learned something in that process, I'm lot. sure. That's right. So read me a paragraph. Let's get the flavor of this book. <laughs> <laughs> Love to. <laughs> Let me find a, a piece. And I got a couple chapters flagged here. But um, I want to just talk about the corruption we encountered. Yeah. I didn't really understand it, you know? I mean, we had our own corruption in Chicago on the south side and through Mayor Daly, but this was like nothing had ever counted. So um, the, the rural manpower program we were attached to had good intentions, employ off-season agricultural labor, put men and women to work on infrastructure building projects before the monsoon set in, build much needed small dams and wells and so on. Um, truth was, it was a bust. <laughs> it was a bust, part of a very sclerotic five-year plan of the sort uh, made fashionable in India, China, and elsewhere. And, uh, I, you know, the local government who administered these programs, as well as other government schemes, were people called block development officers, BDOs, if you will. And, um, you know, they did the hiring. There was a lot of skimming and a lot of graft and a lot of court, but it was also part and parcel of how things got done. So. Um, I'll just read you this one section of how I, my first real encounter with some of this kind of larceny and bribery and extortion and breakdowns. And here's Worse than Chicago. Yeah, here's how, it, here's, here's how it worked. You are a Peace Corps volunteer. You're stationed in the boondocks, say in Ked, which was the name of our village, or up the road where my friend Ted lived in Mongo. You are isolated, but you do get reasonably regular mail delivery. One day, a little shrimp who works for the post office comes to your door in khakis wearing a peak Nehru cap and starch shorts, and he says he's collecting contributions for the KED chapter of the All India Postal Workers Cricket Club. You say, no thanks, I don't play cricket. The next day, your mail stops. <laughs> you wait. You wait some more. After about 10 days of no mail, you go to a trustworthy friend, my engineer friend, and he tells you he'll look into it. A few days later, he comes back to you and says, a little guy, a letter delivery man, is going to come to your door and ask for a contribution to the KED chapter of the All India Postal Workers Cricket Club. Give him a few rupees. He will pay some. He will keep some and pass more up to his boss. Sure enough, he comes, you pay, and the next day your mail starts. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so, I mean. What a lesson. What a yeah, lesson. What a lesson we'll but, work. you know, we, we have our own versions of that in our we society. Yeah. Uh, but this was you know, in stark relief. Well, this, this, uh, this book is loaded with stories like that. It's loaded with, um, uh, with sort of an introspection, but an extra, extra ex introspection too, inside and outside. And not only what's happening, but how you react to it, what you learn from it. Um, Peter has taken uh, a most valuable part of his life and then seen it again through the lens of his later experience professionally. And then you have a really thickened Sentence. And <laughs> I don't right. mean thicken in the sense of hard to understand. It's well written. It's good language. It's good prose. Even lawyers can write good prose. There you go. <laughs> and so you've got to read this book. It's on Amazon. Uh, you've also got to look at our old video from December 23rd where we talked about some of the details. And, whoops. <laughs> and that didn't happen in 1960. No, that didn't happen. <laughs> and, and you've got to go on uh, July 25th to the East West Center and see Peter speak about this very same subject. Peter, thank you so much for My coming My pleasure, back. as always, Jay, yeah. as always. We have to do it again. Good. And always. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Peter. Aloha. Bye-bye.